Hello, hi. What VR conference would be complete without Mission Impossible? So thank you. My name is Howard Rose, and uh, we are here to talk about education and VR, and we're just going to jump into it. Um, and I have an esteemed panel here, and one is via electronic, the magic of, of the television. So um, without further ado, uh, Paul Mlynek. Okay, I, I've been practicing that all night. Okay, so Paul joined the VR industry in 1984 uh, and started Digital Art Forms in 1998 to focus on two-handed immersive interaction. Uh, his resume includes Smart Scene, an immersive scene assembly product that won VR Software of the Year in 1995, and more recently, Make VR, uh, an immersive modeling system with Sixth Sense Entertainment. Uh, Paul is here to share his work at Digital Art Forums and a project with NIH called Motion Gaming for Neuroscience Education. And can you uh, supplement that a little bit and tell us about what you're doing? You bet. So uh, Digital Art Forums uh, was founded in 1998 to build uh, immersive, uh, entirely immersive and uh, interactive applications using this two-handed interface. And most of those applications were designed for professionals, for uh, radiologists, for the, for the military, for uh, designers, with, the, with a couple of uh, exceptions. And what we're doing now is a little bit different from that. We were funded by NIH in uh, 2013 uh, to build a series of games to teach kids about neuroscience, about neuroscience, interest them in the brain, interest them in careers in neuroscience. And at that time, this is 2012 when we originally pitched this, Oculus had not uh, kick-started yet. Uh, we, this was a pre-consumer uh, head mount world. So uh, what we conceived of as, uh, as immersion at that point was manual immersion, putting the, the hands in the world. And so uh, that's what we've done. We've built uh, applications uh, or, or uh, titles for these kids uh, that use the two-handed, uh, not exactly our two-handed interface, but use two hands to reach into space and build brain puzzles and uh, listen to uh, the, the uh, symptoms that a character has to treat different parts of the brain. And now that we're putting them in a zombie world where uh, a character's life depends on them getting it right. So uh, that that's what we've been doing. Uh, now we're moving into uh, a phase two, uh, and the question is, do we stay with manual immersion or do we move into full immersion? Uh, and we've always done work in full immersion uh, with a head-mounted display and, and a pair of hands. And so that's what we're going to do. But we ha that kind of puts us face-to-face -face with uh, the real world issues of deploying uh, curricula uh, in in a, a public school, uh, motion sickness, the health and safety uh, uh, warning that comes with Oculus now. Uh, everybody, uh, there, no matter what you do in VR, somebody's going to get sick, and if one percent of the kids are getting sick, it's a showstopper. It's kind of the one of the Achilles' heels of of education, uh, the health and safety warning. It just went from age seven and up to age 13 and up. So now you've got, uh, now it could be, it, before it could be second graders and up, now it's in middle school. So this really very volatile world where you, you really have to, to take these things head on. And so what we're doing, what, what our plan is, is to build outward from a foundation of manual immersion, which, is, which no one gets sick. We've, been working with that for 20 years. People do not get sick when you immerse their hands. It's when you put the when you put the eyes in the scene that there's an issue. So we will work outward from that foundation, and uh, those who are uh, tolerant of uh, VR and those who match the the whatever the age requirement is at that point will be able to experience full VR. Uh, and we think that that's going to make it so that so that we have. There's no showstopper in there that makes it so that you, uh, there's a group that can't do it, therefore it's a, we're just not gonna go ahead with this kind of curricula. Thank you. 
Uh, there's a lot of jumping off points here, and we'll we'll jump into questions. Um, but uh, so our our next guest uh, is uh, Tony Diepenbrock. Um, Tony is the CEO of Learn Immersive, a foreign language learning platform that empowers teachers to create interactive games in VR. Immersive uh, helps students learn on their own and socialize with other students and native speakers. Uh, and it is free for teachers and students. Um, and uh, they're currently testing their product at high schools and colleges around the world. So can you tell us sort of briefly what, what Immersive is? And Yes, yeah, so for me, learning a language, French namely, was a very static experience. It wasn't contextual, it wasn't cultural, and I don't think I had ever spoken to a native French speaker aside from the few people in our class that visited. So that's, it's really to address that, and we've thought a lot about how to enter this market, and what we've built is actually a tool that runs in the browser, and the teacher can build this little simulation game in which uh, it's all... WebGL, no downloads, no apps, build the simulation less than 20 minutes per quest, uh, two minutes each, and she, he or she can give a URL to the students, and they can play this game in the browser or in a VR headset, but obviously for the next 18 months, two years, it'll likely just be in the browser. Um, so the reason we're doing this is because we want to replace the workbook. If we can put students in immersive simulation games where it's like, go buy a virtual milk at the grocery store, figure out how to buy a shirt in a shopping mall, and it's interactive, uh, speech recognition based, click based, starting very simple, it, it, it's much more engaging for the students. So, so that's what we're up to. We're deploying the product to teachers right now. Um, in our business model, we're still testing it, but we'll likely give teachers the ability to sell their interactive quest based games to other teachers around the world. So we're running trials at high schools this coming fall, as well as colleges and even some enterprises are very interested in testing the, you know, the, the, the level of customization is, is very high, so. Excellent. Um, lots of stuff here. I, I'm excited with questions, but we're gonna keep going. Uh, so Jackie Mori is the uh, founder and the CTO of all these worlds. Uh, they create virtual worlds for customers such as NASA, uh, for astronaut psychological health, and the Army uh, doing mindfulness uh, training for soldiers. Uh, Jackie is a, fain a founder and the senior researcher at USC's Institute for Creative Technologies. And her work focuses on the meaningful use of virtual worlds from health to education. Uh, and she's very interested in uh, how using avatars in VR can affect our daily lives. Yes, yeah, so those of you who are here for the last panel on social VR, I think um, that's an important component of education. So one of the things that, that um, I've always looked at is how we represent ourselves in these virtual worlds and how that can enhance that experience of being within a virtual world. So my company looks at mostly things that can be um, health related or enhance someone's uh, normal life. And part of the thing about education and, and virtual reality is that it's an experience based way of learning. And when I first started at the Institute for Creative Technologies in uh, 2000, we came up with this in, in idea for the experience learning system. We called it the ELS, and you could earn badges for all of the different experiences that you went in, much like uh, Boy Scout or Girl Scout badges. And we really thought this was going to take off. We had videos that showed kids standing under a Saturn rocket as it took off, you know, so they could really get that feel of, of how massive that rocket was. And we had all kinds of wonderful ideas. We never did get funding. I think 2000 was a little early and people didn't quite know how kids would use virtual reality. But, but the important thing to me is that it is this sort of physicality of using your body to learn. And that sets up a memory pattern that is much like our normal physical life. And that's a very powerful way to learn. So that's, that's a start of what I think VR for education is gonna be like. Thank you. Um, and David Levitt. Uh, David is the CEO and co-founder of Pantomime Corporation. 
uh, and they let consumers reach into shared virtual worlds with ordinary mobile devices, and headsets are optional. Uh, he earned a doctorate in artificial intelligence at MIT and uh, was an inventor and product manager at VPL Research. Um, and he's taught at the MIT Media Lab and NYU's interactive telecommunications program. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm very excited about the uses of virtual reality in education. Uh, and immersion is a great way to teach and a great way to learn. And uh, we, uh, there's, there's two different ways to think of it. One is immersion is a great way to interact, direct manipulation. The idea that is behind things like drag and drop makes things easier to do and easier to learn. Uh, in, in virtual reality, you have a, a, a great way to, uh, for example, um, well, for example, if you've seen the pantomime demonstrations here, a kid can reach into a world and see ordinary gravity and then see no gravity and then see moon gravity and immerse themselves in the physical world while they're learning physics. Um, but more generally, you, um, your, 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 your ability to reach in and change things by reaching in is, is, is part of where we're focused. The, um, uh, being, being able to edit worlds that you're actually a part of, so you can step back and either be in the world or modify it, uh, is empowering for kids. Uh, I was in Seymour Papert's lab at MIT, and letting kids discover things and be researchers is central to turning them into scientists or people who can learn on their own rather than people who memorize things. And that's part of why immersion is so great. But uh, I'll say more. Thank you. Uh, and over there, through the magic of the robots, uh, David Whelan. Uh, David is the CEO of Immersive VR Education and also the Editor-in-Chief at Virtual Reality Reviewer. David is best known for his successful Kickstarter campaign for the Apollo 11 experience, one of the top-rated VR educational experiences available today. Uh, David is creating an educational platform called Lecture VR. Uh, to give students access to the best educators, schools, and universities uh, independent of their background or financial status. Hello, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, I'm actually based in Ireland. Um, as, as, you, as you were saying, we are most famous for the Apollo 11 experience, which is a virtual recreation of the Apollo 11 mission where we put students in the shoes of Neil Armstrong. They get to sit on top of the Saturn V rocket travel to the moon, do all the tasks that Neil Armstrong and both of and return all in the space of an hour. And we feel that immersive experiences like the Apollo 11 experience will have students more engaged in education. So the plan is for the first half of class, they do a VR experience like the Apollo 11 experience, or maybe they might actually be on the Titanic just as it's sinking. And then the second half of class, then the teachers are gonna have a more engaged students. And with our lecture VR platform, um, a lot of inspiration has come from the book Ready Player One. So what we're building with our platform is a portal where any educator can go on, upload a PowerPoint presentation and upload an audio file. And then our system will animate the avatars inside that virtual space. So it'll feel like the student is getting one-to-one -one communication, one-to-one -one teaching. And we feel what we want to do is we want to combine the best of MOOCs with the best of traditional learning in this one social VR platform. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd sort of like to throw a question out to all of you. Um, since virtual reality is a completely synthetic environment, um, of course, augmented reality is, is there, but um, I'm interested in sort of the design considerations. You can design the entire uh, environment any way that you want. Uh, what are sort of the guiding design principles that you uh, keep in mind when you're developing and, and you think are most successful? Well, this project, every uh, project we've done in the past has been a tool. So make VR as a tool. We've been, uh, we've done a, a medical imaging platform using virtual reality, but it's a completely different set of uh, design considerations when you're doing that. It's based on effectiveness of, and speed to task and, and those kinds of things. This is the first time we've really delved into a narrative uh, medium 
uh, and we uh, maybe describing the 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 uh, uh, project as a little bit more is the best way to get it across. So we've got this character Fred, and uh, he he has an issue with his brain. So this is a stroke lesson, and we're teaching kids. Uh, anatomy by uh, showing what part of the brain is uh, uh, cor correlates with uh, what function. So uh, in the first part of the, of the game, the kids are building a 3D puzzle with their hands and they, they, the cha one of the challenges there is uh, making a, an interface that they can pick up in 30 seconds and yet uh, uh, succeed at. And it and it turns out that's not that's much easier with uh, with VR. So that we're kind of leveraging our our tool experience wh when we do that. Um, the second part of the game is they need they 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 look at uh, Fred acting out some uh, deficit. You know, maybe he's angry, maybe he's dizzy, and they have to treat that part of the brain, and that sort of drives it home. Uh, but neither of those uh, is really a game is in in a uh, the game genre. Um, the third level is more of a an RTS style. Uh, Fred's running around on the terrain and he's he's trying to keep away from the zombies. And the zombies want brains, but they want specific brain parts. So so we kind of up the ante to where uh, Fred's very life depends on uh, their getting the brain parts right. So uh, and that in some sense we're. Uh, turning up the heat, and they have to throw the brains at him very quickly. And what happens is they come out of this uh, world knowing uh, exactly what brain part correlates to uh, what behavior. And the kids are, uh, I just came back from a focus group yesterday. Um, the kids are just so into it, I had to pry a pair of controllers out of this kid's hands when his time was up. And it, Previous trials, we've had kids cry when their time is up, and kids are cutting in line to learn. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, motivation is a big part of this, uh, and uh, kids will do anything to uh, be immersed, even if, if it means learning something. Yeah, so I think the first thing to keep in mind is who you're designing it for. Obviously, education is a very wide spectrum. So are we talking, you know, fourth graders, or are we talking college students preparing for, say, a job interview in a foreign language? That's where what's relevant to us. So for the fourth grader, or second grader, or even first grader, someone like that, it might be much better to entirely avoid the uncanny valley and, you know, make the characters much friendlier, maybe even 2D in a 3D space, something, you know, less uh, reality-based, much more uh, fun and creative. Whereas for the you know, army, military person learning Chinese or Arabic going in the field, it's, I almost prefer the word simulation as opposed to game because that needs to be much more realistic. We're putting someone in an environment in which they need to perf perform and where they're about to be, so you want that to be as realistic as possible. So that, I think, is the first design consideration is, is really keeping the users, um, you know, what they want in mind and what they're familiar with. Uh, and the second thing, um, uh, actually, yeah, you can go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm going to follow on to what you just said because not only do you need to think about who you're designing it for, but you have to think about what that lesson is. What's the goal of that particular lesson? And the goal of the lesson plays into how you design something. So say the Google Expedition stuff, you just want to get kids familiar with the, the richness of the world, that there are all these other places. Well, they don't have to have a lot of agency to do that. They can put up the cardboard and they can look around and they can go, wow, you know, I've never seen something like that. That's one sort of um, goal for a lesson. But there may be things, more like what Paul was saying, that where you have agency, where you've got, you want those kids to be so involved because they're making choices, and those choices they are making are so powerful to them that they don't want to give up the controllers. They've never had an education where they have the agency to make the decisions, make the choices, put their hands in something, put their head in something like that. And then your work with the, with the language stuff, that may need the social component. 
So I think it, you really have to not only look who you're designing for, but what is the goal of that lesson? Um, and agency is, is a big motivator. Social is a big motivator. There's all these motivators. But I have to say one of the, one of the coolest educational experiences I ever had was being the particle in a particle accelerator in Second Life. And that was awesome. This, this is a great panel for talking about immersion, and I think it's important, particularly going back to the first uh, VR company, to think how much it's changed. Uh, because what immersion used to mean is completely blocking your view except for what this one screen is doing. And that's, that's a, and thinking that the entire world can be captured there. Now, we're really, we're literally uh, uh, what uh, uh, Mark Weiser called the ubiquitous computing era, where there are more computers than people in a typical room. And where, uh, not, you know, not including them would be uh, would, is, is is against reality. Um, part of our approach is to say, okay, every computer in the room that consume and it it helps it helps the process of consumers adopting virtual reality. If you have a PC or a Mac or a mobile device or a tablet in the room, that can be looking into the same virtual world as the other devices. And uh, some of you have already seen that in the pantomime booth downstairs. But what it means is you have more reality. And it winds up being a bigger social reality because there are the head-mounted things that don't let you have eye contact or that don't let someone see the same thing over your shoulder. They, they immerse, you, immerse you in a solipsistic world. What you really want to be immersed in it would be as much like the real world as possible. It's the person who's speaking French, the person you're looking in the eye, and so on. So, uh, you know, th th that's one issue. Then you, then you can be in a simulated world, and where kids get excited in our thing is where they see, oh, I'm, I'm playing this game where if I tie the score, I get a bonus, and they're three ahead of me, so where's the number three ball? And suddenly they're doing math and subtraction, and they're, you know, the, the world that they're immersed in is motivating them educationally and mathematically and whatnot. So there's that too. But I thought I should start by jumping up and saying, it really is the 21st century. There are computers everywhere. And to ignore all but one of the, the one of them on your face is a little bit, bit like the 19th century person saying, someday everyone will have a personal motor and pulleys going to all of their appliances. Yeah. It's nothing like that. It's, it's a lot of different devices. And really having a realistic, immersive virtual world in, requires you to represent all of them. And that's, that's part of what Pantomime is focused on. Yeah, um, they're all great points about um, design and VR for education. Um, one thing that we feel passionate about, especially when we're telling history stories, is that we need to get an emotional reaction from the students. From the students, um, pretty much if you're watching a movie and it doesn't have an emotional reaction, you're not going to remember that movie. Whereas if you cry, laugh, um, like that movie has an emotional impact, you're going to remember that. It's the same in education. So what we play a lot with is with music, especially in the Apollo experience. We have stirring music in the background that heightens the emotion of the whole experience. And as the student goes through the experience, we're throwing facts at them, like this date, um, the 20th of July, um, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, and they're soaking in all these facts because it's having such an emotional impact. So I feel that sound design, is, like I've seen a lot of educational um, apps, VR apps that are great, but they really ignore the kind of sound element, which is half the immersion element of virtual reality. And I think sound should be really focused on as well, especially star music, just to stir up emotions in students. But if you get an emotional student, they're going to remember the experience for a long, long time. OK. Um, we are unfortunately limited for time, and there's so many things to dive into here. Uh, I would like to maybe throw this open for some questions. Does anybody have any questions out there for our panelists? Is there anywhere that the data is available that the case studies have been done in education that we can see what the um, translation is between engagement and retention with an augmented or immersive um, educational platform versus just the standard so we can actually prove um, our theories as to how this might benefit our students? Uh, I can't answer quite yet, but we are running a trial across, I believe, three or four high schools in the Boston region this coming fall, in which students will be playing the same game in the browser and in a VR headset, and we're going to compare how well they retain some of the vocab words, 
and how they do on some of the tests. And that's simply a question of, you know, does the 2D experience, how, like how's it compared to the immersive 3D experience? So I'll, I'll be able to answer that hopefully in about six months. Um, Wake Forest is our educational uh, conduit. So uh, we're working with them and they're, they're uh, setting up the, uh, t the uh, focus groups and trials with uh, fifth grade classrooms in uh, uh, Winston-Salem. And we've only run one trial so far. The, uh, the focus groups are very funny. They, you know, they're the kids who demanded uh, zombies. Uh, we, we had no idea about that until they, uh, they weighed in. Um, but during the trials, they, I have to say the trials were flawed, the first set of trials. We didn't give enough time to either the standard or to our approach to uh, uh, learning these concepts. But we, what we did find was almost a, uh, uh, a, a heuristic uh, result. Um, the kids who got the standard learning, eight minutes of standard learning, uh, standard uh, instruction, uh, were faced with a test and had no idea. They couldn't even wrap their, their minds around the idea of what am I supposed to do with this. They just kind of looked at it, you know, like it was a, holding a rat by the tail. Um, and with our instruction, five minutes uh, of time in Cure Fred, uh, they just started answering questions. They knew that there were correlations between uh, this part of the brain and this behavior, and they knew uh, so they, they, they absorbed a lot in five minutes that they couldn't possibly otherwise. And we, the other thing I should say is we were reaching, that the, the, the class that we're focusing with is a very advanced class. The class that we're trialing with is more of an average, you know, so there's a, a much more of a spectrum. And uh, in the spectrum, we're seeing kids who just would be unreachable, who are barely verbal, who are succeeding in the game. So we're, we're seeing that. But... NIH is very interested and will hold our feet to the fire for, for real uh, <coughs> metrics out of the program. Yeah, real quick, there's a paper that Jeremy Balinson at Stanford did on memory in, I believe, four through six-year-olds and six through ten-year-olds in which he would show them, uh, it was called, it's called memory confusion, and he was seeing if he could implant memories into these young students' heads about whether or not they swam with dolphins or some other experiences. And the main takeaway was that the students that experience VR, uh, in which, they, you know, in the experience they, they see themselves swimming with dolphins, he could uh, modify their, like they actually believed more often than not that they experienced this. So that was a, a very uh, formulaic study that was done, but uh, I don't think any of us have all that much to point to quite yet aside from just a lot of the experiences, you know, sitting down with some kids and, and seeing what they say. Yeah, I'd say not so much with the kids yet, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of reference material on training for the military and, and that type of thing. So it's going to be great to see what it does for kids. Yep. Does David have anything? Anything? No, I, d I haven't got any um, studies done yet for um, knowledge retention in kids. But from our own experience, um, when we arrive to a school with, with 10 headsets, we often have a queue of kids waiting behind uh, in school for two or three hours just to try out the experience, the Apollo experience. Whereas if you try to put them into a history class, they just won't be, won't be that involved in it. But it will be about 12 months before the studies are actually complete. Okay, um, we have time for one last question and some very quick responses, please. Okay, great. Greg Panos here. A very quick question. Uh, are you thinking about students having their own VR units or sharing them? Uh, like, will it be initially sharing and then some, something to motivate them to have their own systems to plug in to prevent, you know, spread of disease and, you know, whatnot? Um, that's a huge uh, factor, and it ha you know the, the costs in schools, for example, prevent you from having uh, VR headsets for everyone, even if you wanted to. But also, you know, we, we see a lot of teachers who say, "No, I'd never put one of those on," uh, but uh, and then, or, or or we're switching to tablets, uh, and uh, I think. I think whichever solution, you know, we, we have a particular approach, but it wants to be something that really lets people interact whether they have a headset or not. 
so that uh, if you're looking into uh, you know, a pantomime style handheld virtual world or the kind that you're talking about, then that's something that the person next to you can, can share with you and you're immersed in that sense, not in the isolating immersive sense. And that works better both economically, better for older teachers who are allergic to headsets and better for students who can't afford individual headsets. And it may come in, you know, like through Google Cardboard where it's very cheap and, and you start that way and, and then the cost of this hardware and stuff is going to come down. So who knows where it's going to be in 10 years. Yeah, that's, there's a very good reason why we're starting in the browser and that's sort of like he said, it's going to take some time for teachers to be willing to A, put these on themselves, B, put them on their students and, you know, C, dealing with kids younger, younger than 13. So... The goal is to engage student teachers first in the browser, get them familiar with a tool that they love using, that's easy to use, and then over time, hopefully we build something that looks start something like Tilt Brush, in which you know teachers are using their hands, they're using paddles and in, in a headset, knowing that you know this is the experience they can create. But I think it's going to be a very gradual thing. You're going to see Google Cardboard take off in some classrooms. It's going to be a very slow burn. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's all the time we have. I want to thank our panelists, and uh, please give them a round of applause. Thank you.